The first talk is going to be by um, uh, Professor Peckham about uh, integrated modeling. I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, the second talk will be about, uh, so the first one's about uh, building frameworks from, from components. The second talk is going to be about uh, the fact that as we build models, they start to become more and more complex, and can we use principles of thermodynamics to help us uh, limit the amount of complexity that we actually have to implement because uh, uh, oftentimes we find the systems actually behave in ways that are much simpler than might be reflected by the complexity of all the components. And then the third talk will be by, uh, uh, by a philosopher of science who will continue our co conversation about uh, to the extent to which confirmation is actually possible and how we should uh, work at it. So uh, let me invite uh, uh, Professor Peckham to come up. Professor Peckham's from University of Colorado and he's particularly interested in this issue of how as people build uh, different uh, entities, uh, how we can combine all of that knowledge together into larger modeling frameworks. Okay. So first, I'd like to uh, thank the conveners for inviting me to this meeting in Vienna. That was really, uh, I guess I should stay here so you can hear me. I uh, just wanted to thank you for inviting me to, the, to Vienna for this meeting. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, what's called a research faculty or a so-called soft money scientist at the University of Colorado in Boulder. So I have no uh, hard component to my salary. I get all my salary from grants. And so you'll see reference to numerous grants and projects that I and have been working on here. And uh, the first one I'm going to start with is this one CSDMS. Oops. Um, let me make sure I go back. This logo right here, which is a kind of an awkward acronym, but it's a Community Surface Dynamics Modeling System. So it's a project that started about eight years ago um, to focus on the idea of code reuse and sharing. So we have all these great models around the world that people have developed uh, for you know, different processes, hydrology, landslides, glaciers, all kinds of surface dynamics things, atmosphere models. There's a huge variety, but there's, there's also a lot of heterogeneity um, among that set. And so we'd like to somehow be able to make it easy to reuse and share this in an open source way so that if you like something someone else has produced, that you can easily put it to work in a composition of some kind. So that's the premise of that project, which led to my my uh, last few years of work in cyber infrastructure. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about that project, um, which is still, still ongoing. I'm now on other projects with EarthCube, but this is still ongoing and what, a lot of what I'm doing ties into this and was, in, was originated from it. So that's a picture of the Flatirons uh, in Boulder, Colorado. This is that CSTMS website. And the, the goal is to sort of twofold, to have a repository of these models that are open source that people can contribute and have a brief description of their model in there, but then also to try to have, we have working groups that would select which models they would like to be uh, used as plug and play components, and then those go through a process to make them plug and playable with other things. Um, you can browse models of different types in there, there's a and you can download code for individual models. There's, but there's also a web modeling tool where you can take the ones that have been componentized and plug and play them into new configurations uh, that you'd like to try. Now CSDMS, like I said, started about eight years ago, but now we're up to um, you know, almost 1,400 members divided into different working groups. There's working groups focused on terrestrial models, marine models, coastal models. There's people working on just cyber numerics uh, issues. There's separate focus groups on the Chesapeake Bay area or hydrology or carbonate modeling. So we've got a, a good representation of different uh, types of models. And so that's, it's cutting across the geosciences and a lot of what we need to do is, is something that's not domain specific. So we're looking for solutions that are not specific to hydrology or glaciology or any particular field, but things that would cut across and be usable across the geosciences. So one of the, uh, several previous speakers mentioned this issue of uh, vocabulary and anybody who's talked more than a few times on this realize this is a big issue, so I have a slide about it. Um, and it's, there's no right or wrong definition of what model is or interface is, but these words are very highly overloaded. And so when I'm, when I'm talking about them, I want you to understand what I mean when I say model or when I say model component or, or interface. 
And so I have some definitions here, but the, the uh, basic idea of a model for us is you have some equations that model the state of some system, and you discretize it in space on a computational grid, and then you use those physics, which involve a time derivative somewhere in the equations, to march the states forward in time to some future time that you want to predict, given some forcings, like it could be climate or something. And so that's the type of model we're talking about. And there, you know, in other communities, you have Stella models, and you have dollhouse models, and you have, you know, conceptual models. You have, you can talk about numerical models versus uh, mathematical models. And so that word model has to be pinned down, and that's what I'm doing here. A model component is one that's been specially, when you especially prepare a, a model with a little bit of extra work so that it can be used in a plug-and-play environment. And I'll tell you more about that. An interface is another one that you have to be careful with because there's graphical user interface, which is what a lot of people hear, but most of the work we're doing is talking about more like an, an API interface, like an interface of, of um, member functions or methods that are being presented by something that lets you interact with it. And uh, then a modeling framework is something that may not be familiar to a lot of you, but the idea is it's a bigger environment that is able to instantiate these model components and then do things to reconcile their, their incompatibilities automatically and to make it easy to, to plug and play things. So if you've ever been inside of a PC and you pull out a video card and put in a new video card from a different vendor, it's that kind of idea that you take, take out things and put in new things and make it that easy so, that you can, so it still runs. Um, and then I won't talk about uh, workflows on, in this talk. So, so when we get all these, com these models contributed to our repository, um, linking them together, well, why is that hard? Well, it's because of all the ways that the models can differ. And so the key ways they can differ are these, these five here, which is they could be in different programming languages, which could be very different, some object-oriented, some interpreted, some, you know, lots of differences there. Um, they could be in different computational grids, and they could have different time-stepping schemes. It could be fixed time steps of different sizes, or it could be adaptive time steps, or there's even something called local. Uh, time step methods, where each pixel has a different time step. Um, there's variable names that could be different between the models and internally. Every data set, every model has its own names for things, its own abbreviations or, or syntax. And it makes it difficult to share if they're not the same or if we don't have a mapping of what they mean by like a list of symbols of what their symbols mean. And then there could be different units. And so in yellow I show that there are solutions to a lot of these problems that we were able to find when I was the chief architect for this project, and we were able to, to deploy and use, leverage the, the efforts of others to solve some of these problems, like, like DOE had something called Babel for the uh, computer language interoperability, and there's ESMF has an excellent regritter that uses multiple processors, and it handles all kinds of special options. Um, time interpolation is not so hard, um, but when it came to variable names, we looked at things like the CF standard names from the climate and forecasting community, and we looked at other control vocabularies, and it just wasn't really a good uh, general system for building, you know, standardized terms that you could map your internal vocabulary to so that you could reconcile these things automatically. So that's something I spent a lot of work on the last few years, and I'll talk a bit about that. Uh, but then unit conversion is also straightforward. There's packages from um, Unidata and other places that will convert units. So this is, these are the issues you face when you try to connect these things. Babel is this tool, which I won't get into, but it's, it's very clever and, and tries not to impact your performance for when you um, compile your model to some kind of a shared object or a, or a library and want to then make calls between those libraries, even if they were written in different languages initially. And so, so Babel helps us with that problem. Um, the CSDMS regretting tools include tools from other people, other groups. So this is an example kind of what goes on there is where you have in the first model on the left, you have a, a uh, model that uses some kind of Voronoi cells. And then it wants to share data with another model that uses rect rectangular cells. And so there are different options for how you might, uh, like in this top picture, how you might go from values on one grid to the other grid. And you might want to conserve mass while you do that, or you might want to conserve a flux of some kind or, or whatever. Um, so, so now I'm going to turn to this thing that is an innovation of ours that I think is one of the biggest contributions of that CSDMS project is this idea of a basic model interface. 
And this, this was a problem that involved a lot of social aspects as well as, as technical aspects. And we did our homework and looked around the world at what's being done by other groups that had plug and play frameworks and sort of distilled that and simplified it to the greatest extent we could so that it would be more easily adopted by our modelers. And that was the big, the big thing is we had to do, give, give the modelers a, a task that, was, that they would be agreeable to do and that wasn't uh, a lot of work for them. And so this is just a, a fun way to sort of illustrate the problem is the upper right picture is all these enthusiastic models that come to CSDMS, but they're a little chaotic and they're all different. And they don't respond to the same uh, commands or, or controls. But when you wrap them, with, in this case you're wrapping them with uniforms, but you put some kind of a wrapper on them, and the, they have some met standard metadata on their, on their jacket that tells what kind of a component they are. And they also learn to respond to standard commands. So, so I can say march, about face, halt, to any of these guys, and they know what to do. And we want that to be the case for the models also. So if I say initialize, update, finalize to a model, that the model just does that, but it does, I don't have to learn its own internal syntax to get it to do that. And this, uh, this leads to a lot of um, benefits, but you want to, again, you want to do it with minimal change. And I, I always point out, inside those uniforms, these are still people just as different as the people in the upper part. They've, they've voluntarily uh, hidden aspects of themselves for the sake of working together as a team. And that's, that's kind of what we're trying to do with the components. Now this basic model interface is just a realization that if you're going to have a framework that's going to control these models, each model had its own clock initially that runs through time because it's stepping through time. And we need to suppress that clock so that this framework can take control of a clock and then be like an orchestra conductor telling each model when to to run and when to share its variables with other, other models in the, in the connected system. And so we need these model control functions like a universal remote um, to do initial, to initialize or update by one time step or finalize the model. We also need some, uh, a lot of, uh, we need the models to be self-describing in a standard way. So when the framework calls one of these BMI functions to the model, it might say, what variables do you need and what variables do you have? And what are the units of those variables? And what grid do you use? And what time-stepping scheme do you use? And so this is a way for the framework to ask uh, querying questions of the models to get all that information. And then it can use that information to reconcile the differences between the two models that it's coupling. And uh, I guess the third important thing is these variables and uh, getters and setters, because in order for variables to pass between two components that are connected, the framework has to call a get on the one that's providing it, and then has to transform it somehow with units or grid or whatever, and then do a set on the one that's getting it. And so these additional functions, the first part is a little refactoring, the model control functions, a little bit of changing your code just to make it a little cleaner how it's structured, and a pretty fast thing for a, a modeler to do. The other parts are functions that are additional to their original code. They sit outside of their code, and they just, they just describe the model in a standard, they answer standard questions about the model. And that turns out to be where the magic is. That's, that's really the key to solving this big heterogeneity problem we have with all the data sets and web services and models is to have these resources be self-describing in, in a standard way so that some other piece of software can, can ask them something and, and learn about what they do and then decide if there needs to be something else happen before they connect to something else. Um, also, this, uh, we use lots of different computer science ideas. One of them is this Hollywood principle which is uh, kind of fun, which it says, it's don't call us, we'll call you. And that's where we don't make these models have any dependencies on our framework. We don't want them to import anything or call anything or talk to the framework through function calls they make outside because they didn't initially start that way. They had no dependence on the, on the framework when they get, were given to us. We don't want to put that in. So every, all communication is from the framework asking questions of the model when it wants the information, but there's no chatter that goes at, back the other way and that, that keeps it non-invasive. So this is kind of what it looks like in a picture, is you've got these models that people contribute, and they hit this BMI target, which we've made as easy as possible, and we have templates they can follow in, in different languages for Python and for Fortran and for whatever. It, the same idea works across these languages. And they implement those functions to describe their model and to give us control, and then we can put a, a simple wrapper that adapts those functions to match whatever framework we want to connect to. And then up in the framework, there's these service components or mediators that 
do things like regrid if necessary, or convert units if necessary, or do time interpolation if necessary, or, or whatever has to happen to reconcile the differences that it learns from the self-description. And so um, this was sort of an epiphany moment for us in this project is because initially we were building essentially a custom suit for each model that made it fit our framework. Now we, we, uh, we have them hit this target of BMI, which the developer can do for us, and then one little wrapper will take their BMI-enabled model and match it to whatever framework we choose. So one piece of code, which works for any model, will, that has got hit in the BMI target, now makes it adaptable to the framework we want to use it in. And so that turns out to be a very powerful idea that we have really uh, taken a long ways. So I want to um, talk a little bit about these standard names now, because that's a, that's a problem that wasn't available off the shelf that we put some work into. And here's the problem. Um, if you want to really automate the, this framework and make the framework do as much work for you as possible, it needs to be able to understand what variables are in the models that could be exchanged and what they really are. And it has to be reliable. And so one model in the top here might have uh, some variables like for output called stream flow and rain rate. And those are what it's called inside the model. Another one says it needs discharge and precip rate. Well, if you're a hydrologist, you might think that those are the same thing and that these could be compatible. But you're using your domain knowledge of synonyms and things to make that happen. We would like the framework to be able to know if those are the same thing so that it can connect this automatically. And so now we get into linked data and control vocabularies and, and semantic issues. And um, what one great solution in computer science is a hub and spoke approach where if you have some very descriptive um, set of uh, or rules for constructing descriptive variable names that are unambiguous, that are very clear, that are human and machine readable, then you can map internal names and abbreviations and symbols to those resource by resource, and then that lets the framework connect any two of those resources that have been through that process reliably. So these resources could be models in this case, or they could be data sets. And so if I have that simple mapping between, it's like a list of symbols from whatever the symbol is in their code to what it actually is in some standard in the hub, then the framework has enough information to know exactly which models could potentially be connected uh, by variables and, and can automate a lot of this work for us. But then the question is, well, what are, what are those rules? How do you make these nice names that humans can read and that, you know, capture all the complexity of different averaging that could happen or, or integrals, time derivatives? There's a lot of var variables that could happen that could be vectors, that could be tensors. So, so we've looked, we studied a lot of controlled vocabularies in a lot of these models, and we know what things need to be described, what quantities we need to have. And we've systematized the thinking of what a variable is. A variable, you know, variables are really our currency. They're in our equations. They're in our, we have input and output variables for our models, and they're what's stored, the values of these variables are stored in, in the data sets. And so variables are really critical to, to whatever we do. Um, but what is a variable exactly? Well, it, it turns out one of the fundamental parts of it is there has to be some kind of identified object that you're thinking about, or a substance, like the atmosphere, or this cup, or my laptop, and then some quantity that you want to, to measure on that thing. So maybe the diameter of the top of the cup, or maybe the mass of this cup. And so those things like mass, or velocity, or, or partial pressure, or whatever it may be, are, are the quantities, and those are distinct from the thing like air, or soil, or snow, or whatever that I might apply it to. And if without both parts, it's not a variable. Because in, a, in code, you never just say temperature. If you do, you're not saying enough, because a hydrologic model could have air temperature, snow temperature, soil temperature, and so you have to say the object part and the variable part. And similar to that, we've gone through thinking about what process names, how to define those, and how to define um, all these different pieces, pulling in things from other communities, and have started to build this into an upper ontology that people can use with linked data. And then the lower ontology is saying that this variable name is of, that, of this type that's defined up above, or this process name is of this type that's defined up above. So we've gotten a long way um, recently on this, this job. Um, here's a couple of quick examples. It's basically this idea of entities or objects that have attributes, and then those two things make a string, and then they point to a value. So the values are what's going to be passed between the data set and the model, or the two models, but we need the, a label, unique label, to identify what they are. So we have um, a lot of work that was done prepping for this and scoping this available online in this wiki. 
which goes into uh, all the mathematical operations you need to build variables and what quantities there are and, and synonyms, how to distinguish albedo from reflectance and these subtle issues, different types of heat capacity, because you have to be very clear on each of these concepts to make sure that that semantic matching is, is uh, correct. Um, I'll just briefly mention a couple of other things that we've been doing. In, in the last few years, there's uh, an effort to incorporate uncertainty quantification and parameter estimation into these modeling frameworks so that it's easy for a modeler, just as easy as he can plug and play models, to actually apply standard packages for uncertainty analysis to their model. And the idea, so there's the one, after evaluating several alternatives, we like this one from DOE Sandia Labs called Dakota. And it's also based on this idea of components. And this and all methods like this, all, all tools like this, um, basically have the same pattern that's shown in the diagram here for interacting with your model to, to do uncertainty analysis. And so we can make our models compatible to this diagram using that same idea of a standard interface so that um, someone can just choose to apply whatever techniques Dakota might have in it to their, their model composition or to an individual model component to, to study its uncertainty. Um, I mentioned that my current funding is off of this, this uh, big initiative that NSF has. It's a 10-year, at least 10-year uh, initiative called EarthCube, which is kind of a weird name, and I didn't come up with the name. So, um, but think of a data cube for the Earth. And I have uh, one of the projects that's funded through EarthCube is one that I lead called Earth System Bridge. And the idea there was I became a colleagues with a lot of people who also worked on modeling frameworks for different communities, like the ones for ESMF, the ones for OpenMI, used in the UK here more, or in the, in the Europe more, and some other ones out there. And so we realized we were doing a lot of the same things and that there were ways to, to, to maybe describe our, our frameworks more clearly and make our frameworks more compatible. So if someone was getting their model ready for one framework, it could also be used immediately in these other frameworks with no extra effort. And so we, we looked into that problem and this is just the web page for that project. Uh, this is a description of that Earth System framework description language that tries to describe what each framework can do so that you understand technically how it's similar or different. And then this, this part's very cool because we found that if somebody hits this BMI target that I mentioned earlier, which we try to make as simple as possible, then with that adapter idea, we can automatically deploy that model into any of these other uh, framework shown here, which includes OpenMI, CSTMS, CSMF, and some others. And that's because the information that BMI exposes upward to the framework is the same basic core information that all modeling frameworks need to do their job. And so that makes it possible, it, it makes it, it helps solve a social problem because when you're trying to convince a modeler to, to do BMI or to describe their model better, you need to give them a big payoff if they do it. Well, the big payoff here is they don't just get to use our modeling framework, so they're not coding to our framework, but they get to use any of these modeling frameworks after they've done that initial bit of work. And so then we find the adoption is, is, uh, is greater because of that. Um, I'll just mention we did some crosswalks to, uh, or we're working on crosswalks to different vocabularies um, in different domains, and we're hosting meetings on that project with different communities like the Deep Earth Process community, the hydrology community, and now we have a meeting in Boulder coming up in May with the environmental chemistry communities doing atmosphere uh, chemistry, aquatic chemistry, soil chemistry, and looking at, at standardizing name construction, unique variable names across these different uh, communities, looking into these basic rules about what it means to be a variable name and how, how, how to make one unambiguous. Um, we got some demonstration projects on that thing. I'm also involved in these other two projects uh, on EarthCube, Geosemantics and Ontosoft, which I won't get into now, but you can, if, if these talks are available online, um, you can pursue these. There's links scattered throughout this talk to, to learn more. And then um, I have a series of papers on these different topics. So there's the first one on the actual design of the CSDMS modeling system. And that talks about BMI and some of these ideas that we came up with. And then this other one's uh, proceedings paper on the standard names which has now got a lot of funding driving it, so we're actually connecting to lots of communities and doing a lot of work with that. And then this Emily is a, another proceedings paper on a smart modeling framework, so it's trying to make this, the framework as smart as possible about not just enabling connecting components, but telling you when two components, it would be a bad idea to connect them. And so to do that, we're actually digging into uh, standardized uh, 
model assumptions. Like when you, make, when you write a model, you, you throw out certain things, or you make certain assumptions, like you exclude snow, or you, you use a certain numerical method, or you solve certain equations, or use certain grids. All that's metadata that could potentially be captured, and we talk about it to each other with standard strings, like Boussinesque approximation, or Navier-Stokes equations, or whatever. And that's how we currently communicate to be clear on what our model actually has in it. But that has never been captured in a system before. And so we started to build a big system of what we're calling assumptions, so that a model developer can be very explicit about what is in their model and what's not in their model. And then the framework has access to this through semantics and can help users make good choices when they're trying to either select among a large selection of models or just to know if they connect these two that it's a bad idea because one conserves mass and one doesn't, or, or something else is incompatible, different time scales, so vastly different time scales or something. And so that's, that's been another interesting thing is, you know, how smart can we make these frameworks? How much work can we make them do? And they can do a lot if they have this standardized metadata. They need to have these resources and these things that they work with described in great detail. And once that's available, then the framework can actually do a lot of the thinking for you, a lot of the drudgery for you. And you can always, you don't need to worry about it being automatic because you can always go back and see what it did automatically for you and override it or, you know, get a report on it. So you don't have to think of it as, as a black box that's getting out of control. It's still checkable. Um, and then we got a more recent paper looking into this coupling with Dakota um, on the uncertainty analysis. And this is a, the word towards is important in that title because uh, it's laying things out, but it hasn't actually been fully implemented yet. So, so thank you. I'm ready to take questions. No, that's, that's, uh, that's right, and it's, there's so many different ways to talk about the word model, and another distinction that people make that they have found important is there's model engines, which are just the source code, but it's usually with a configuration file applicable to different regions, and so then the model, as applied to a particular region, becomes the model. For instance, the ROMS ocean model, when applied to the Chesapeake Bay area, is then viewed as taking the, the ROMS engine and applying it to that area to make the, the Chess ROMS model. For that, for that area. So that's, that's another subtlety here, but um, it's, it's just important with the language as you're speaking to people about this to throw in these other words, like mathematical model might be the, the list of equations that I'm actually gonna code up. And that's my, that's my, really my conceptual model or all my equations and the input and output variables that I'm going to actually link up because of those equations. Um, but then there's the numerical model, which is where I actually try to solve those equations. And then new, new uncertainties might happen just because my solver um, for different time steps is not stable or is not, doesn't have good fidelity. And so there's, there's a whole hierarchy of uncertainties and issues that, that you have to get into that, um, and be aware of. Um, you have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those of us who do uh, education and trying to teach our students about models, uh, do you have some general comments or insights about what we should be doing in that respect to make this process easier? Yeah, so there's, there's been this evolution. I, you know, um, back when I first started programming, everybody was trying to get people to stop doing go to's and stop writing spaghetti code. And so the idea of modular programming that had a flow through with you know, while loops and repeat loops and things so that there were no go-tos. And I, I took that seriously. None of my code, I've written a lot of code and none of it has a go-to. So it's, it is possible to not do that. But then the idea of modularity came along and then the idea of object 
oriented approaches to things came along, which is a further refinement of that modularity idea that's very powerful. But then this, this is sort of another step in that chain. We're not giving up any of the previous things, but now we're saying, and you should also document your code, of course, you know, put lots of comments in your code, and now you should put it on GitHub as another best practice and let other people see it and, and review it. But this is saying if you do one other thing, which is to provide some standardized description of your model with these BMI functions, selecting from control vocabularies, and it's a relatively easy thing to do. We're trying to make it just as easy as possible, but if you do that additional step, then you really enable reusability. That now, now any other system that wants to learn about the capabilities of your model can call these functions and learn exactly what grid is used and whatever else is going on with that model. And that, that makes it powerful for compositions, but also for search, because if there are standard names um, published as part of what a model can do, you can search on that unique string and find potentially in the future all the models in the world or all the data sets that offer that particular variable as a way to, to decide what you want to do. Are there tutorials that people can access? There are, there are tutorials and there's also, we try to give templates to people so that we have an example in Fortran, an example in C, an example in Python of somebody implementing a, uh, this BMI interface. And it, it really is, it, it might sound daunting, but it's really simple. A lot of these functions are just simple uh, answers to simple questions, you know, like um, what are the units you use? You said you have this variable, what are its units? What grid do you have it on? Um, One question. Um, the, the, the coupling networks you, you propose here, do you think are they in principle capable of also accepting effects, of scale invasive effects of synchronization, you know, among, across scales among different models, or do we have to enlarge the idea of coupling networks to accept such effects? So, you mean if there are problems with, because of the coupling? No, I mean, if, if from some local effect in a model, some synchronization effect appears across a larger entity in space or time. Are those networks in principle, those, those coupling frameworks in principle, capable of allowing that? Or do we have to rethink the coupling network idea? Yeah, I don't, I don't see any, um, I haven't seen any barriers to that yet. There, there was a, a crisis time in the atmosphere or ocean community where they were first beginning to couple the at ocean atmosphere models and things went really bad. And they didn't know exactly why at first. And there's, sometimes you have to be aware of a, a particular conserved quantity that has to be honored when the time steps are different or whatever to make sure there's a good fidelity to the coupling. Uh, we haven't seen that in any of our stuff yet. So it's, it seems special to the equations, the nonlinearities of the, of the systems. But um, this lays everything out very cleanly. So if you want to monitor the models as they run or profile them or do anything else, the framework can be given all these other capabilities. And it can also, if you wanted to write the output of a contributed model to NetCDF in a standard way, that's an extra added value the framework could give you without you writing any code that writes NetCDF because it has total control of your model. And if, it, if you tell the framework then every this and this time, do a grid snapshot and save it to a NetCDF file, you can now do that and that's what the framework people write this code once at the framework level and then all the models that are used within the framework get to use that capability. So there's lots you can do this way. So our next uh, invited presenter is Axel, Axel Clyden from, uh, from Max Planck Institute from Biogeochemistry in Jena. And he is uh, going to present us an alternative approach to model complex earth system science uh, um, processes. And want to show us like how the thermodynamics, uh, based thermodynamics limits can be used to model a uh, complex system in a very simple way and yet that must be like a reliable system so reliable predictions can be achieved looking forward yeah thank you and also thank you for um, inviting me here um, yeah so as uh, Runia already said so I thought I make a simple title um, can't we just keep it simple and then I have a longer undertitle that um, sort of specifies what I have in mind um, so this is based on research. I mean, I have been looking into thermodynamics for quite a while to figure out what information it can actually give us in um, uh, using uh, or applying it to, Earth, uh, to the Earth system and also in modeling. So there are more aspects to thermodynamics than what I'm going to talk to, uh, uh, about here. Um, so 
We know the standard way. I mean, when you think about Earth system modeling, then usually what happens is um, something that you know um, Jules talked about this morning. So you take the Earth and you, you know you build a complex Earth um, system model that um, um, splits it up into a grid. And uh, the trend there is that um, things always become more complex. There are more model components. There's a higher resolution, finite time stepping, and so on. And I think. Um, one problem with this is, is I mean, it's of course for, um, certainly absolutely justified for making better predictions, but in terms of understanding what the main dynamics are in the system, it's, I feel like it's getting more and more obscured. And um, so, I mean, I originally studied physics, and one thing that you learn in physics is that you do back of the envelope calculations. And so, this is the path that I want to present here is, you know, how can we make robust estimates based on back-of-the-envelope calculations. Um, and with robust, I mean that they are really based on physics and not so much on empirical parameterizations. Um, and I want to first make a brief comparison. Um, so here, what I show here is sort of, um, um, I have an axis here of complexity from simple to complex to more and more complex. And so when we think about Earth system or the climate uh, system, then, you know, we, uh, 30 years or 40 years back, we had energy balance models, and then we get coupled ocean, atmosphere, land models, and now we get atmospheric chemistry and dynamic vegetation and so on. And um, I want to make that um, a reduction to an example from physics where you have a similar kind of um, increase in complexity. And this is when you think about, um, you know, you can have a two-body system that you can just describe with Newtonian dynamics, but when you actually get to an n-body system, it can actually behave already quite complex. And then you think, well, if you get to 10 to the 23 bodies, it gets really, really complex. And um, some of you probably know this order of magnitude. This is a one mole. This is the number of molecules in a mole of gas. And so then something wonderful comes in physics, and this is statistical physics, and it allows us to actually derive thermodynamics from this. And thermodynamics is very simple. I mean, when you think about the ideal gas law, it describes 10 to the 23 molecules in just one equation. And so the goal that I want to do here is, or, and that's the, um, you know, the ultimate goal, is to do something similar for the Earth system, to derive something that is based on something similar, or a, even on thermodynamics, to infer how this complex Earth system uh, actually behaves. And I use here the term, it's, uh, it's an emergent form of simplicity, so it's not an ad, ad hoc simplicity, but it's simple. The emergent behavior is so simple because the system is so complex that in the end it is being constrained by thermodynamics. And um, the way this can be applied is sort of outlined here. Um, so you, um, it's a view where you view the Earth system as a consequence of energy conversions that are driven by solar radiation. These conversions are constrained by thermodynamics. Um, the dynamics in the system, they evolve towards or are even maintained at these thermodynamic limits, there are uh, important feedbacks at different timescales that alter these limits, but then in the end, the system becomes predictable because they are constrained by these thermodynamic limits. And um, I just put here a little note that I just uh, published a book on this um, that is even here available on the conference that describes this view on how you can see the whole Earth system as these sequences of energy conversion. And so what I'm going to talk about here is um, I want to give you a really brief crash course on thermodynamics. Um, typically, when thermodynamics is being taught, you know, you get, you get very quickly very complex, and so I try to keep it really simple. Um, then I want to show three examples where you can actually, or where we were able to show that with a simple approach, we can actually reproduce very much co more complex models in a um, very... Um, adequate way, and then give some perspectives on what um, this view of the Earth system can actually inform us in how to build models. And um, so to start with Thermodynamics 101, uh, you know, it's like an introduction course in, you know, undergraduate um, uh, program. Uh, I think the one thing with thermodynamics that I like to start off with is, is uh, it, it, uh, it happens every day around us. And uh, one typical example for me is that, you know, when I, in the morning I take a cup of coffee into my my office, you know, one thing that happens is it cools down, you know. You wait long enough and it gets cold. And, well, 
technically speaking, it's not quite completely correct. I mean, what happens is that you know energy is conserved, so actually the coffee gets cold and the room gets a little bit warmer. Um, but actually, the energy conservation doesn't tell you that the coffee gets cold. The, the law that tells you that the coffee gets cold is the second law of thermodynamics, which basically says that energy is being dispersed. Um, okay, so that's a you know, qualitative um, picture, and uh, we can make this more quantitative. It's actually, these two laws are really important to um, describe how much energy you can confer, convert, and so this is here a sketch of, um, this is a drawing of the um, steam engine that uh, Watts um, has invented, uh, I don't know, 200 some years ago. Um, so what does it do? You know, you have a heat source. Um, this heat gets into the engine, drives a cycle, produces some physical work or power, work through time, and you have a waste heat flux that, you know, exits the engine uh, through the chimney. And um, you can uh, and, and this conversion process of performing work is uh, subject to the energy cons uh, conservation during the um, uh, conversion process. Here, this is the heat in, heat out, and this is the, the power that is derived from the heat engine. Um, then the second law of thermodynamics enters in form of an entropy budget. This is actually, unfortunately, a concept that is not very often being taught, but it's really central. So, you know, uh, the second law usually you learn it from a, um, for an isolated system that means um, you know the entropy can only increase it can't decrease but when you have a system that is not in uh, equilibrium then you actually need to account for fluxes in and out so you need to um, look at entropy exchange of the system this is what's being described here so you the entropy leaves the system by by this flux and entropy enters the system and so it puts a constraint and then in the ideal case, this is equal to zero, and from that then you can infer um, what, is, oops, what is called the Carnot limit. And so this is a common form, and it's, basically it says that the power is constrained to be less or equal to the heat flux reduced by an efficiency that depends on the temperature difference between the in and out um, at which heat is added and removed. Now, we can think of the Earth system being in a very similar way to a heat engine. It's being heated by solar radiation, primarily at the Earth's surface, and it's cooled by emission of terrestrial radiation to space. And in between, there is power being generated to drive and maintain the atmospheric circulation, the ocean circulation, the hydrologic cycle, and so on. And um, so this is what I want to um, actually show in the next slides as an example. So I'm getting here... Um, into the second part now where I highlight these three examples and um, the first one is on surface energy balance partitioning um, as you some of you I, I assume you know the surface energy balance and the difficulty is the turbulent heat fluxes you know what do I mean what does it uh, you know we usually do some semi-empirical parameterizations for the turbulent heat fluxes and how do we get a handle on these now, one way to think about heat fl these turbulent heat fluxes, and I lump them together, the sensible and latent heat fluxes, that they actually, they are heat flux and they drive a heat engine in the atmosphere that actually drives convective motion. So here, um, this, is, uh, this is our little system here described. Uh, so you have a surface at a certain temperature of the surface temperature. It's being heated by solar radiation. Then we have some long wave um, exchange between the surface and the atmosphere. Uh, but here, in between those two reservoirs, we have a heat engine that performs work, drives convective motion, and sustains the heat flux that goes into the engine. And so we can start, make this quantitative, so we have a Carnot limit. Now what's really important to consider is that actually this temperature difference between the surface and the atmosphere actually depends on the heat flux. So it's not an independent temperature difference, but the more turbulent heat fluxes we have, the more we cool the surface, and the more we reduce this temperature difference. Um, and we can express this by actually just looking at the energy balance. And so we can use the energy balance to express this difference. And then we have something that increases with the flux on this side. And we have something that decreases with the flux here. And so we get a maximum. We can derive it analytically um, with some approximations. And there's a simple prediction from this very simple application of the Carnot engine is that the energy partitioning should be about that half of the absorbed solar radiation should go into turbulent heat fluxes and the other half in long wave, net long wave exchange. And, well, you know, we have a lot of data sets that we can compare this to, and um, this is what's shown here. 
Um, I'm a land guy, so I focused here on land. This is a study from a few, uh, two years back um, where we looked at or where we compared this prediction actually um, to the ECMWF reanalysis product across different regions at the climatic scale, so climatic means. Um, so what's shown here is the absorbed solar radiation from a satellite product and then here the turbulent heat fluxes on the y-axis, um, the dots are from the ECMWF and the red line here is the one-half line. And then we can also separate this further into sensible and latent heat. Um, but you know, the agreement is actually um, pretty good as a first order guess of how large these fluxes should be. We also went further and looked at the diurnal scale to see how um, fluxes follow the diurnal um, variation. There we had to make a slight adjustment to the thermodynamic limit because we need to account for heat storage changes in the atmosphere as boundary layers grows and, and shrinks. And that alters the thermodynamic limit. And um, what I want to show here just is the four, four, um, observe, uh, four sites here in Alaska in uh, central Germany, Israel, and rainforest in Brazil. And here's the comparison of what is observed in terms of, terms of the turbulent heat fluxes or net radiation and what is being predicted by maximum power. This is the prediction without um, this heat storage effect, which um, also leads to a high correlation but a wrong slope. It underestimates heat fluxes, but when we account for this heat storage effect, we can actually get fluxes that are very well in agreement with observations. Um, Okay, so the next example I want to show is about hydrologic sensitivity. This is something that is quite uh, well known and studied in atmospheric science. It's about the question, so when we have a certain degree of global warming, how much does the hydrologic cycle, and specifically precipitation, how much does it change? Now, in steady state, uh, precipitation equals evaporation, so we can look at evaporation rate, and this is the uh, rate uh, that I showed a few slides back. It's, um, it includes here um, the absorbed solar radiation and a ratio that for some hydrologists might be actually well known. It's a sort of this equilibrium evaporation concept. It's the slope of the saturation vapor pressure curve and the psychrometric constant. I mean, these are both physical properties. And uh, we can now think about, well, what happens if the surface warms? And there are two different reasons why it warms. It can warm because you have an elevated greenhouse effect, or you can have um, warming because um, solar radiation increases. And so you can write this as a you know, um, partial uh, sensitivity, relative sensitivity, and so you see, well, you can have, so you can have a change in temperature due to the greenhouse effect, or you have, can have a change due to solar radiation. Um, and um, you can calculate how much this is for global mean conditions, and so you get a sensitivity of about 2.2% of warming that's just due to the temperature increase, and then another 1% if solar radiation actually increases because of the warming. And that, that's something that we can compare to climate models, um, climate models of global warming, but also there are actually sensitivity studies that are um, done with respect to... Um, um, <clears throat> geoengineering, where you try to combat global warming by reducing solar radiation. And uh, so you can actually use these estimates and you can see that we are well within the clouds of, of climate models. And specifically, we can see that this change here doesn't... Comp um, yeah. So the, the warming by greenhouse um, can be compensated for by a reduction in solar radiation, but the changes in the hydrologic cycle don't, ca um, don't cancel, and this is completely in agreement with the climate models. And the way we can interpret this is actually the, um, by looking at a pot, of, on this, um, a pot of water on a stove, and there are two ways to, you can heat um, the pot. You can either put a lid on, and this is like the greenhouse effect, or you can increase the, um, the heating by turning up the heat of, of the plate. And um, that's, of course, uh, both can result in an increase in the temperature of the pot, but this one here will increase your energy bill, and this one won't increase your energy bill. So there's certainly something to be learned when you look at the, the energy fluxes. And what it means is that what solar geoengineering actually tries to do is it tries to compensate the temper temperature increase by the lid by reducing the heating of the surface. Um, the last example um, I want to talk about is about limits to wind energy. So this is no longer entirely thermodynamic, but it's more like an energetic look at, um, the, um, at motion near the surface. It's basically 
um, when you really want to understand how much wind energy can you pro um, possibly get, you actually need to uh, account for the fact that each turbine removes some kinetic energy from the atmospheric flow. So we need to look at energy, we need to look at kinetic energy. And um, you can construct a simple model. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail, but it, it, basically the starting point is a momentum balance. Um, so you have a momentum balance that, um, you know, you have the forcing, a momentum transport from the free atmosphere, you have friction at the surface and a, a, a drag by the turbines. From this you can infer wind speed and then you can f estimate how much power can be extracted from the turbine. And what we find is that actually this simple model can reproduce the sensitivity of a much more complex climate model, a general circulation model, actually very well. And one of the key effects is actually that there's a strong interaction of the turbines with the flow. And this is what's shown here. This is a paper that we are currently, that's currently in review, where we show that the reduction in wind speed is actually the factor that really limits how much um, wind energy c you can generate. Here, this, uh, the, um, so we compare this maximum power limit that from the simple model with the maximum power we infer from climate model simulations and we see that the wind, speed, uh, wind speeds of the two approaches compare very well. And so with this I want to um, come to perspectives or you know, I, I did, didn't think summary is appropriate so I thought well what does it actually mean? Um, I think what it means first is that thermodynamics really adds additional relevant information to how we model systems. You know, we all know energy, mass balances and momentum balances, but we hardly think about the entropy balance. And so it's a constraint that is rarely used in models and actually it may cause problems in energetic consistency, what I refer to as energetic consistency, and I think the prime example for this is actually limits to wind energy. There are, there are, there are estimates out there that, that are just physically impossible, simply because the effect of the turbines on the flow are not being considered. So it's uh, actually showing, um, bringing us to the second point, that um, the limits in the Earth system, I mean, they emerge from a combination of thermodynamic limits but also from strong interactions between the processes with their boundary conditions. Yeah, so the first example I showed with the surface energy balance, it's the interaction of the turbulent heat fluxes with the surface temperature. Um, the second example, um, oh yeah, I skipped the second example. The third one is the, the interaction between, between the turbines and the wind flow. And on the other hand, um, you very often have models that operate with fixed boundary conditions and um, therefore they reduce a certain level of interactions that you um, probably are going to have. I think this is something that is important to keep in mind. Um, what I showed you here is that there's a simple predictable behavior from these limits and it suggests that systems really um, evolve towards their thermodynamic limit. And um, I think that uh, can perhaps provide a perspective. Um, you know, in hydrology there's the buzzword of co-evolution, well, I mean, I think this is a, certainly a direction, a co-evolutionary direction that is directly coming from thermodynamics that could be provide uh, quite, uh, quite useful. And then the last, I think that this um, simple approach by using, based on thermodynamic limits, really provides some baseline, uh, baseline reference for better understanding the behavior of complex models. I mean, in the end, the behavior is, you know, like the comparison between the hydrologic sensitivity derived from this one equation compared to the GCMs shows you that one can actually just learn about the very basics, what's shaping a sensitivity um, from, from the simple approach. And um, I probably haven't emphasized this, but actually the, the estimates that I showed are actually free of empirical parameters. They are just based on these limits. And so I think this is a complementary approach to Earth system modeling. And with this, thank you for your attention. Hello, good morning. I was uh, particularly delighted for this presentation because it comes from a, a fellow physicist that speaks uh, the universal language of nature that applies to all the Earth system, um, both ocean, atmosphere, uh, hydrological system. It's, um, this being said, I would like to pick up the point of uh, 
providing co-evolutionary directions uh, towards equi thermodynamic equilibrium. And uh, it is indeed, a, I'd just like to, to comment on that and to hear your opinion. So uh, recently in 2014, uh, we introduced a, a, a non-ergodic dynamical system formulation that provides a co-evolution index, which essentially is a thermodynamic quantity that tells you how fast or how slow uh, in a continuous scale you are evolving towards equilibrium. Do you think that this kind of uh, strategy, uh, which is based in uh, thermodynamic dynamical systems, not on slow fast dynamics, but on physics, do you think it would be welcome in this, uh, in this approach? Do you think there is promise in this kind of uh, treatment? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think there are two different things. So, I mean, there is a direction towards thermodynamic equilibrium, but when you think about the Earth system as a whole, it's actually that the, this equilibrium is in space. It's not on Earth. And um, so it's actually, um, you know, the, the, the ability to generate power and to even maximizing power accelerates the, um, the run towards equilibrium outside the Earth system, but it maintains the Earth actually in a state of non-equilibrium. So I think one would have to probably think about it a bit more, what you said, because I think the co-evolutionary direction would be towards um, like maximum power, you know, it's given by the thermodynamic limit and not necessarily by the state of thermodynamic equilibrium. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, the heat death of the universe is the, the equilibrium. <laughs> Thanks, Axel, for this. Um, gives us lots to think about. Uh, at the beginning, you started by uh, invoking the tension between understanding and prediction. And um, uh, part of that tension comes from uh, the issue of how, well, it's reflected in the complexity of our models, right? The simpler models are easier to understand. Um, very often we use uh, notions of uh, how much information is contained in the data as a, as a, as a, as a mechanism for constraining how complex mm -hmm. the model is. It seems to me that perhaps you're also suggesting that um, uh, uh, through thermodynamics there's actually sort of um, uh, uh, an optimal complexity that might emerge, which is something about the information contained in physics as opposed to the information contained in data. Th does that make sense? Um, I have to think about that in more detail, but I can say, I think, a few words. I mean, I think there's definitely something to do with information in there. I mean, perhaps just to um, um, emphasize, I mean, what I talk about is, of course, thermodynamic entropy, which is not quite the same as information entropy. I mean, it gets at the limit uh, or at the scale of, of um, molecules and photons and so on. You can see it as the same, probably the same as information entropy. But um, I think it's definitely something to figure out because, I mean, the thing is, yeah, I mean, in terms of information content, I mean, this model doesn't really have much information content, right? I mean, it's a, it's a very simple but then, of course, you know, the um, behavior of the climate model is also reduced to just the climatic mean response, which is also, in, in a certain way, a compression of information. So, but, but your physics understanding is telling us something about how much information we need to, to include in our models in order to get yeah. broad behavior versus the details, yes? Actually, yeah, okay, I mean, I think um, this thermodynamic limit, I think what it does is, I mean, actually it means that you ha need less information to specify your process, right? Because um, normally with turbulent flux parameterizations, you have some conductances that are empirical and you have some wind speeds and so on. And that information is basically dropping out here and you don't, you don't actually need that for, for specifying. So I hope that helped. <laughs> Thank you.
So the last talk of the morning is uh, by uh, Dr. Charlotte Wendell. She's from the University of Salzburg and uh, uh, I guess more correctly described as a philosopher of science. And um, so she's going to bring us back around to the issue of um, the issue of confirmation. To what extent is confirmation actually possible or how we would go about achieving it? Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and also thanks for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. So, um, as already said in the introduction, I'm a philosopher, and more specifically a philosopher of science. I have a background in math as well as philosophy, and then had to think hard whether to become a mathematician or a philosopher, and decided to be a philosopher in the end. And it's just that you know how I would characterize a philosophy of science. So what is it about? I would say it's very general. It's really just about investigating conceptual problems that arise in the sciences. And of course, there are lots of conceptual problems. I just give a few examples. Um, what I write here, for instance, the issue of confirmation, when is a model confirmed? Um, the issue of what, what kind of statistics you should use. So should you use that classical statistics for a certain problem or Bayesian statistics? Um, what about unobservable entities in science? Do they really exist? So this is more of an ontological question, or are they just constructions? And also the issue, for instance, of reduction. So what does it mean that one theory is reduced to another? So there are, there are lots of questions. So these are just some sample questions. I could easily list another 100 questions. But just wanted to give you a flavor what philosophy of science is about. And I mean, at least the kind of philosophy of science that engages with the actual sciences, and I think that's the good philosophy of science, uh, in this case, I think there's often not the clear boundary between scientific, scientific disciplines and philosophy of science. Why? Well, you, of course, also find in um, disciplines discussions about conceptual issues. And I think whenever there is a discussion about conceptual issues, you are in the realm of philosophy of science. And what I will do now is simply to present some work which I was concerned with in the past uh, years, really, with my colleague Katie Steele from, from, the, from LSE, from London School of Economics. And I will, I mean, these results are really done uh, in the paper, they are formally, but they are done formally, but what I will do here is just present them intuitively because we don't have the time and I think it's easier for getting the message to present it intuitively. So I want to just start with an example to introduce the pro problem. Example is the aerosol forcing, very familiar to all of you of course. Um, these are these small particles in the atmosphere. And let's suppose now there are these models where that we have a climate model where the aerosol forcing um, is a free parameter which you have to estimate and it measures the change in radiative forcing resulting from a certain concentration of aerosols. And as I said, important now is that you have this step of estimation and I refer to estimation as calibration. So there is no unified terminology here. So I think it's important that you keep in mind whenever I talk about calibration, I simply mean estimation. That's the standard term in philosophy. It's also widely used in climate science, but some people use tuning. Some understand calibration differently. And this is a terminological issue. It shouldn't concern us. But just keep in mind, calibration really here means estimation, or sometimes people also uh, refer to it as tuning. OK. So the question is now, you have a model, you use data to estimate a parameter, calibration, then the question is, can you use the very same data to confirm the model? So using it twice for calibration as well as um, confirmation, and this is referred to as double counting in the literature, double because estimation, confirmation. And of course, that's a very general uh, issue that arises whenever you deal with three parameters. Um, it's currently hotly debated in climate science. You can find many papers um, from climate scientists also about it, um, writing what they think about it and raising their concerns. And I mean, I could give lots of quotes, but I just give one here. I um, just want to say that a common position is that, <coughs> common position endorsed by climate scientists as well as philosophers is this idea that uh, the no double counting rule, that you cannot use the same data twice for calibration and confirmation. Um, I just give one quote, as I said, I could give more. This is from the IPCC report where they write, if the model has been tuned, so tuning is calibration estimation, tuned to give a good representation of a particular observed quantity, the agreement with that observation cannot be used to build confidence in that model. And you see the first is really about tuning, and then, so very, where is it? 
build confidence, this is the confirmation issue. The question is, when, if I use data for tuning, can I also use them to build confidence in the model? And they say no. And, I mean, what we are arguing for um, is a much more subtle position that it really depends on the confirmation logic you employ. And at least in a Bayesian framework, um, this is not the case. So in the Bayesian framework, double counting is entirely legitimate and arises just naturally. And I will, as I said, I mean, you can show that formally in the normal Bayesian reasoning framework, but I will just give you an example to show you, I mean, to show you intuitively what is going on, because I think for the other thing, we really don't have time. So let me just illustrate the intuitive idea, which can be formally underpinned, as I said, with an example. And for this, we need first some terminology. The terminology is, oh, sorry, let's go back. Terminology is that we have base models. The base models are denoted by M and N, and these are simply the models where the free parameter has not, is left unspecified, so there hasn't been assigned a specific parameter to the free parameter yet. So it's like you see here, I chose some very, very simple, anyway, the simplest base models, M and N. M is just a linear base model, so YT is distributed like MT plus, I mean, this is really just a normal distribution, an error term. It doesn't, it doesn't, the details here doesn't, don't really matter. So what I did is choose, I chose, we chose in a way the simplest uh, examples and so we just added a normal distribution with a mean zero on standard deviation sigma. And N, the second base model, um, is simply not linear anymore, but it's a quadratic base model. And you have, you see here, for the first base model M, you have one free parameter M, and for the second base model N, you have one free parameter N. And second terminology, which will be important, um, is model instances. I think it's clear what model instances are now. These are really um, what you get from a base model when you assign a specific parameter to M and N. So M1, for instance, is just a base model where you have assigned the parameter to the parameter M, the value 1. So it's just YT equals T plus the normal distribution. But it's the terminology of base model and model instances which you need, um, of course, to formally make sense of the idea, or to conceptualize the idea of double counting and the problem of double counting. And in this framework, of course, now, the question of double counting um, is as follows. It's just a question that, what I write here, if data is used to determine which instance of a base hypothesis is true, so you determine which instance is true. This means you um, calibrate, you find out which parameter value is best. This is the calibration. Can then the very same data be used to um, confirm the base hypothesis? And it's important here to confirm the base hypothesis. You know, everyone, of course, would say, well, if you, conf if you calibrate or tune, you estimate um, and you arrive at a certain model instance, it's clear that this model instance is confirmed, but the issue here is not the confirmation of model instances, but whether the base hypothesis is confirmed again. And that's the real matter of debate. Okay, so um, let me briefly um, outline the rest of the talk. So this was the introduction now, uh, quite a long introduction where I introduced the problem and introduce the, the very simple models which I will use for illustration. Then we'll talk about two kinds of confirmation briefly, one comparative and non-comparative confirmation. We'll say something about that soon. And then talk about some inductive problems. These are interesting problems, I think, which are sometimes confused or conflated with the issue of double counting. And then if, the, if time still remains, I'll give an example where you really see, I mean, that this is not just some conceptual debate, um, in a way which doesn't play a role in science, but it really does. Here you see, there are lots of case studies you could uh, give here, but here I give one where you see um, how these issues um, play a role, whether people think that something is confirmed or not. Okay, what is comparative confirmation? In a way, that's the conceptually easier confirmation where you just say you compare one model, let's say M, with another base model, let's say N. So it's really comparative, that's the, it's in the name. Um, this is the second point here. Two specific hypotheses are compa compared. And as I said, I use probabilistic confirmations here to tackle questions about the double counting. Um, 
probabilistic confirmation theory is often also called Bayesianism, although it's Bayesianism, it's a bit a loose term, some people understand different things for it. And as I said, you can, what I will say intuitively later, you can prove with, in this formal framework. Um, I'll just um, briefly tell you, and you're probably all familiar with it, but it's still good to um, recap this, what the basic um, tool of Bayesian confirmation theory or probabilistic confirmation theory is. The idea is, you calculate the probability of the model given the evidence. So this is what you want to know. This is the confirmation you want to know by going back to the probability of the evidence given the model, which is of course much easier to obtain, multiply it by the probability of the model and divide it by the probability of the evidence. It's just standard probability theory to do it in that way. And it's of course, as I said, I mean, based on confirmation theory or probabilistic confirmation theory is a major framework of confirmation theory, also used in the sciences, but there are also other um, frameworks. And I can say more about other frameworks um, later in the question if someone is interested in the question period. Okay, now I'll just give, I mean, uh, I give the intuitive argument which you can formalize. And of course the example is chosen in a way uh, that it seems all very natural. Um, so, Let's suppose you have 11 data points. Of course, usually you have more, but it doesn't really matter. And you wonder, think back about the simple examples M and N, so the base models. And then you wonder, well, I want to calibrate, estimate my parameters now, given these 11 data points. Um, a very familiar scenario to all of you, I'm sure. So what you do is just, you determine the best fitting model instance. And suppose that in this case, um, it is for the linear model y equals 5t and for the quadratic model um, y equals 2t squared. So it's just what you also do in a normal linear regression. You find the best fitting model and you've used the data now once for calibration or estimation. And the important thing now is when you look at that specific example is if you look a bit more carefully uh, then you of course, immediately think, well, the data seem more linear than quadratic. So why? Well, this linear, the line y equals 5t seems to fit the data much better than uh, the quadratic um, curve. So what goes on here um, is that M5 has just a much better fit with the data than N2. Um, Formally, this means that the probability of the evidence given M2 is smaller than the probability of the evidence given M5. And if you then plug this in into the machinery of Bayesianism, you get that M is confirmed relative to N. And this is, as I said, it meant that the example is chosen in that way, that it seems very intuitive, but it's what's going on at the formal level. The 11 data points here just naturally seem to, seem to be legitimately used for both confirmation and calibration. And as I said, you can show that generally. You can, I mean, this is, if everyone is interested, I'll give the references to our papers at the end of the talk. You can just generally show that in the Bayesian analysis, one reason why double counting arises and is legitimate is that one model has a better fit um, with the data than the other model. There are other cases, um, I can't go into them, of other cases of double counting. They're also legitimate, but they are, they arise for another reason. Um, it's also interesting, but I think this is the more intuitive one, so I, I presented this one. And at least from a Bayesian perspective, in this case you would say, well, there's worries about double counting, using data twice for confirmation and calibration are really besides the point. So, now I said that at least from the Bayesian perspective, um, double counting seems entirely fine. There's a lot of debate, um, as I also said before, in climate science, a philosophy of science, also in economics, um, other disciplines as well, about um, the problems and why it might be problematic to double count. And we think that often there are other problems underlying these, uh, these debates. And I will comment on, on two of these problems. So one issue that arises, um, especially discussed in climate science, or the climate sciences, I know well, we discuss this a lot, is the idea, ah, sorry, first, com sorry, I, I, I was already at the inductive problems. Um, the non-comparative confirmation, just very briefly, 
is, and before we come to the inductive problems, the, the non-comparative confirmation is then really not the question whether M is confirmed relative to N, so two, two hypotheses com compared, but whether M is confirmed um, <laughs> per se. So the question is whether M, model M is confirmed to core, the relative to the full complement. Um, it's a bit more complicated to deal with formally, of course, but the conceptual issues really stay the same. So I don't, I won't go into this, and we'll just work with the, um, just to say that the argument I gave for M versus N for comparative confirmation goes over to the non-comparative confirmation. So now the inductive problem. So this is the slide I should have used before. So um, what I said, I think there are often two other problems underlying the debate. Problems about inductive reasoning, but I think not problems about um, double counting. So let's go to the first problem. This is the issue of relevant evidence. So what I write here may be disputable um, whether evidence is relevant. More specifically, the worry might be that um, the lifespan of the model is, for instance, the medium run future, but the evidence concerns only the past. So the idea is, well, you might have data, but the data aren't really relevant for the model, and if the data aren't relevant for the model, then you shouldn't also use them to calibrate um, or to estimate parameters, and you shouldn't use them to confirm the model. So you might think, well, why would one think that this is the case? Um, the underlying thought here seems to be that sometimes the lifespan of models is really very short, because um, the models do not include the main processes um, for, the, for a longer period, in this case for the medium run, medium run future and the past. And as I said, if you, if you think that this is the case, then in a sense the data aren't really relevant to the model. And then of course, the data shouldn't be used for calibration and shouldn't be used for confirmation. They have one statement um, by Stainforth et al, where they express that, um, and I know that they expressed that idea because we discussed it also in, in a lot of detail. The right statement about future climate relate to a never before experienced state of the system. Thus, it's impossible to either calibrate the model for the forecast regime of interest or confirm the usefulness of the forecasting process. So that's one problem. And I think, of course, it's a legitimate problem. And one, of course, should worry about this and wonder whether there really is this problem or not. Some think there is this problem, some not. Um, but important is really more of a failure of confirmation, failure of calibration, but not an issue about the legitimacy of double counting. And then a, a second problem, which I think is more specifically often confused with um, the problem of double counting, is the idea, well, if you have a model where whatever the data, there will always be a good fit, that's trivial, isn't it? So if a in a polynomial model, for instance, with 100 free parameters, they will provide a good fit to any arbitrary 100 data. Um, so you use them for estimation, and then of course you don't want to say that the model is confirmed because it's entirely trivial. And of course we would agree to that. So in this case, from a Bayesian perspective, you would say that, well, then M and the complement of M are both equally successful. And of course you calibrate this estimation, but there is no confirmation in this case because it's trivial. And that's an important special case of where you simply have calibration and absence of confirmation. But some philosophers as well as climate scientists um, conclude from this very case that in general double counting is, is illegitimate. And I don't think that's right. That's the right conclusion to draw. Because sometimes you have these cases. Here you don't want to say that there's confirmation. But in other cases you might well want to say that there is. Okay, then at the end just briefly one example. As I said, you could give many examples and there are further examples also in our paper. This is a paper by uh, Nutia et al. in 2003 where they use mean surface temperature changes to constrain the aerosol forcing. And you, the, the issue here is non-comparative confirmation. You wonder how good is my model M. And you start with a specific initial uniform probabilities range over the aerosol forcing, minus two and zero. Um, minus because you think it's, uh, it's about cooling the Earth. And then they have the idea of consistent model instances. So the idea is you just sum up the difference between the data points of a model instance and uh, the real data. 
and if the difference is smaller than a certain constant, then it's consistent, then the model instance is called consistent. And of course, the smaller the constant, also the better. And what they do is, in a way, they follow very closely what the Bayesian framework would suggest you to do. They use the data for calibration, so to narrow down that interval to minus 1.20 as the uh, range of the aerosol forcing given the observation, so that's the estimation step. And then the question is, well, they've estimated now the aerosol forcing, is there also confirmation? And they seem to think that there is, um, because, I mean, they don't write much about it, but there are some comments in the paper where they say the model could have failed to simulate the data, so it's a real achievement that the model does um, simulate the data. I mean, here you see just, I mean, this is my final slide in a way, um, this black solid line is a consistent model instance. You see that it's not perfect because the areas where it's out of the gray, the gray range, the light gray range are the observations. Um, but this is just an example of a consistent model instance. So they, they think that there is confirmation as well as calibration. Um, but as I said, other climate scientists would be more concerned about uh, saying that because they think that's not really legitimate because the lifespan of the model is the medium run future and the evidence concerns only the past. So the second inductive problem doesn't arise because this is a model which can be falsified. It's not like 100 free parameters and uh, 100 data, so it's a different case. Okay, so this is just a conclusion now. Um, I'm the at the end of the talk, as I said, just wanted to give you a brief flavor what philosophers of science um, do um, in, with their time. And one issue is this conceptual problem of double counting, whether it's legitimate or not. There's a lot of discussion, and I think we better, rather than relying on our intuition, it's good to look at specific confirmation frameworks and see what they tell us about whether it's legitimate or not. And in Bayesianism, it's legitimate. Okay, then just the final slide with two of our papers, if anyone is interested. Otherwise, I'm looking forward to your questions, and thanks for, your, yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah. Hello, thank Hello. you very much for the very interesting and uh, I love this kind of presentations because they, rise, they raise uh, all this controversy and debate mm. and that is very, very constructive. Um, I have uh, uh, two very short uh, uh, sure. uh, questions. Uh, one pertains um, the issue with uh, the inability of the past to tell us anything. Um, uh, there is actually the, what, what you think about the, the issue uh, that um, in many fields of physics, laws that drive the entire universe, including Earth, um, that you have a dynamical evolution that while not purely deterministic, you have evolution of probabilities, of probability structures, that our present is a function of the past and the future is a function of the present. So you have a, a, a chronological history driven by entropy production. And the second question is, this is all very uh, nice on the Bayesian structure. However, um, Bayesian probabilistic uh, frameworks, they assume uh, a, a probability structure in the system. But in many cases in the climate system, the, in the hydroclimate system, the probabilistic structure is evolving dynamically and therefore the skeleton of the probabilities is itself changing. How would you address these issues? Thank you very much. Sure, thanks for the question. I might probably start with the first, uh, with the second one, sorry. So, I mean, this isn't really a question about, um, I couldn't go in, I mean, maybe I, this is actually the final slide is good, um, because you, these two papers, the first one is actually about Bayesianism, about Bayesian confirmation theory, the second one is about another confirmation theory, namely model selection theory, which has Bayesian components as well, but some, there's also classical model selection theory, and this is more about classical model selection theory. So. You need to ask, given a, a certain problem, what's the best confirmation theory? What confirmation theory you want to use? And it might well be, I think it is the case actually, that in some cases the Bayesian framework is not the best one to use. So in some cases it might be, in some cases not. And um, that's perfectly fine in my opinion, so you just need to think about what, what is best for a certain situation at hand. And I think the task of the philosopher, or even just generally to 
for conceptual clarification is to find out what, what's going on with double counting in the different confirmatory frameworks. And that's why this slide is good. So I talked about Bayesianism. And the second paper is really about, as I said, classical model selection theory. And here you actually get different conclusions. Here the double counting, in especially the idea of use novelty, that data have to be use novel, meaning that they haven't been used before for something else, have a certain relevance. So it really depends, but I think that's also progress. It's not like you ask the question, is double counting legitimate? And then the answer is always yes or no. Um, but it depends on the confirmation framework. And that's a good thing to know. Rather than relying on our institutions, we know them. Yeah, I think this is what I would say. And one would, one would have to look at a specific case. There might be cases where the Bayesian framework is too rigid. There are, this, this could be. Um, and for the first question, I'm not entirely sure whether I, uh, I, I understood it, but I think the idea of the relevance of past data, there are different issues. Of course, there's always, I mean, there's this famous problem about induction, you know, Hume's problem in philosophy, this very general problem, um, where, of course, there's always an issue about what can you say about the future given the past data, you know. But the problem um, I presented is a much more specific one. Um, it's not this one, the problem first. It's really about uh, here when you, when you have the feeling that the lifespan of a model as it's constructed, maybe because you haven't resolved the, the evolution of the ice. So if you talk, I mean, I, I, I talked a lot with climate scientists about that and they said one reason they think that is because some of the slow, uh, uh, slower moving processes aren't really resolved in that model. And so, um, I would just say there are different issues about how past data are relevant for the future. And this is a, a very specific one which arises in um, climate science, but it might be interesting also to note that, I mean, this problem, of course, arises also in economics. So sometimes economists, when their models don't uh, fail to reproduce, uh, to predict the economic uh, reality, um, in some cases they were pointing exactly at that problem that they say, with hindsight, we think that we weren't careful enough. Hello. Um, <clears throat> the, the entire week, um, in most of the presentations, um, what, what colleagues were doing is, is the, the two-step process you were also alluding to. First, you calibrate mm. wh whatever code model mm. you're using, mm. and then you uh, thank you for not using validating, but you, you confirm, you, you test it. Huh? And usually the, there's only one test, and then, then we're happy, we, we, we feel we're safe because we've tested it once. I feel this is a, a, a very naive approach to, to model testing in general, because mm -hmm. you could say, okay, but how about testing the test, you know? And, and this is actually what happens if you, if you look at the history of your science, that science, yeah. you, you keep on testing hypotheses and at some point they fail and they're replaced. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so a few comments on that? Sure. Or? Yeah, sure. I think it's a good point and I think I, I, think I would agree. I mean, it's, I mean, of course, I had, had, didn't listen to all of the talks, so in a, in a sense, um, I, I, I can't comment on the specific talks, but I would entirely agree with your point that of course one should often try, if possible, to um, confirm model in different ways, use different data. Of course, it's not good to use the same data twice or very similar data, but it's very good to test the model as much as you can by, yeah, there are different methods of doing that. And of course, the history of science shows you that if you go back to Newton, for instance, and study that in detail, you see that they, they did all kinds of tests. Um, and of course, there's also philosophical literature. I mean, if you're interested in that, maybe we should point that out, that exactly this issue of I mean, there's this conceptual problem. I think it's nice that you alluded to it. The question, well, maybe how can we make sense of this intuitive idea that it's better to confirm a model not only in one way, but in various ways? Um, and there's also, con uh, of course, philosophical literature, conceptual literature about that, um, where some people, and just to give you an example, you might say you have qualitative aspects of confirmation and quantitative ones. Some are based on modeling, some are based on physical understanding, but it's just, uh, this is just the beginning. There are other issues as well. So I, I would agree. And yeah. Thanks for very interesting presentation. I mean, uh, something that we really get in this uh, AGU conference. So yeah, that's very interesting coming from the philosophy point of view. 
my question is very, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to go to your uh, point of the, the model validation where you use the criterion judgment and there the question of the deduction and induction comes, which is like the more that when we use the double counting of this, that's become like the, the induction, the inductive judgment become more circular. I mean, which is the sex to us argument which is quite famous, mm -hmm. okay. You now, mean, that the, the, I think I just want to be on the same page. Is this the, the, well, uh, the quote the, here? Sorry, no, where is it? Is it this one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, in general yeah. as well. There are yeah, many quotes like that, yeah, and okay. it's about circular reasoning, yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to take you a little bit to the one Indian philosopher, which was Karvaka. I don't know if you have heard about him. And his, I don't know his name, yeah. Yeah, so he was also using the, that, uh, uh, something about the predicate and he was using that the predicate connection is invariably, uh, the connection, it, that the, the evidence that, that we get is not sufficient, okay? And then he was do that, uh, the efficiency, I mean, if, you, if your predicate are not sufficiently justified, then the efficiency of the interference could not be uh, stated. Can you comment something on that? Can you can you say it once more again? Because I'm not sure yeah. whether I've understood. I mean, it. Yeah. So the, uh, what he was trying to do that he was in. So for example, in your case of the model that you have some predicate, okay, in the predicate, then you try to uh, validate that. Yes. Predicate. So what he was telling that if it's the invariable connection is there, and that has not sufficient. Uh, or, I mean, the, the, the validation of that, that is insufficient, that you can't state anything about the model. Okay. Yeah, I mean, one would have to look, you know, I would have to look at the specific, the specific re re reasons. I think one, I mean, one of the conclusions you should take away from the talk is also, I think, that when it comes to conceptual issues like, simply the simple question, is double counting legitimate? Am I allowed to use data for calibration and confirmation? Um, and then you go back to your intuitions and you might say, well, that's a bit dodgy, that's circular. Um, it really depends on the specific cases, on the specific confirmation framework. That's why I said I would have to look at that specific case to say more about it. So um, I would just say that, that you also in philosophy, also for conceptual issues, you have to be just really precise and work very precisely and then, then you find out what's, what's going on. And there might be well some cases where what you say is, is appropriate. Yes, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I, of course, I wouldn't want to say, and I think the climate scientists like staying for that out, I wouldn't want to say that um, all the data we have of, of the, all the data, all the various data we have of the past are completely irrelevant for, for our models of predicting the future. That's not the issue. Of course, they, they use their physical understanding to arrive at the model and so on. But the, the specific issue is, of course, you use already some data to construct your model. You know? And then the question is, what remains then of your data, does this add anything extra? And here they would be cautious. Although I should say, I mean, this, this, this quote by Stainforth that I'll, they are certainly more on the, uh, on the more I mean, radical note, but on the, on the stronger spectrum in the sense that they really have very strong worries about it. Other climate scientists have think that it might be a bit of a problem, but it's still better, or our, it's still legitimate to some extent at least to do, to do the calibrations, better than nothing, you know, to have this data. Um, others think um, it's not a problem at all. But yes, of course you're right that I would entirely agree it's not that all past data are relevant. But the question is given the specific data set and what you have already done with your model, do they add anything else? Do they confirm the model? Thanks.
So thanks again to all the speakers of the session and <laughs> all of you that. attending the session. I hope there were some new insights for you involved in that. And um, let's see, maybe we can do that again next year. So have a nice last day of ETU. Goodbye.